Good morning, and welcome to Wellesley Village Church. On this Sunday in the Epiphany season, January the 17th, 2021, which is also Martin Luther King Jr. holiday weekend. We gather today in the spirit of the prophetic tradition that calls for God's light to shine on this earth and for justice and righteousness to roll down like mighty waters. We join Martin Luther King Jr. in proclaiming that prophetic vision that comes forth from our scriptures. At Wellesley Village Church, we are an open and affirming congregation of the United Church of Christ, which means that everyone is always welcome here. As in the words of Martin Luther King Jr., we create together beloved community. So I'm glad that you have set aside this time for worship and ask that you would join me now in prayer. God, may your light and your truth shine down among us. May we be those who arise in the light of Christ and shine forth with his spirit. May our worship today anchor us in that spirit and truth. May all that we do and all that we say bring you glory. So dwell in us, in our prayers, in our music, in our hearing of the scriptures and our reflecting on them. May your word come to life in us through Christ our Lord. Amen. Good morning, young disciples and disciples of all ages. Whenever Jesus traveled about, oftentimes large groups of people called multitudes would gather to listen to his words of hope and healing. But sometimes Jesus' words were topsy-turvy and upside down from what they expected to hear, like love your neighbor as yourself and give to others. Radical. One time he told the multitudes, you are meant to be a light. God's not a secret that we keep, so don't hide your light under a bucket, but put it on the hillside so that everyone can see it and know God. But I don't look like a light, so how can I be a light? Let me tell you a story about a family who lived in a very small village on an island. And the dad's job was to keep the light at the top of a lighthouse going so that ships that pass by in the night could stay safely away from the land. The story is from the times before electricity, so the light was actually a real flame powered by oil. One day off in the distance, the people could see that a storm was building. As the day wore on, the storm got bigger and bigger and got closer and closer. 
The waves grew bigger and the wind blew harder. It was decided that the people should cross the bridge to the mainland where it would be safer. But our family stayed put for the light had to go on. So dad stayed all night and managed the light while mom and the kids carrying big jugs of oil went up the 200 steps and down the 200 steps, up and down, making sure the oil never ran out and the light never went out. When morning came, they did it and kept the light burning. And the only damage from the storm was a little bit at the bridge that people were already fixing. So all of the townspeople could come back to their homes that day. Our family sat in front of their fire, warm and toasty, filled their bellies with food and rested. Mom told her kids that they should go to bed. They had to be exhausted. But the kids looked out their window and they could see the dark houses of their neighbors. And they wished for them a fire as warm and toasty as theirs when they came home. Wait a minute, maybe they could help. And with the help of their mom, they took coals from their own fire and filled a bucket. And they went from house to house and they made a fire in each of their neighbor's homes. And when they got to the end of their journey, they looked back and they saw each home was warm and glowing from the fire they had shared. And so it is with the light of Jesus that is on the inside of each of us. Our kindness, our compassion, shares the light of Jesus with each person that we meet on our journey. So shine on this week with the gifts that you have on the inside of you. Friends, God certainly helped call us out of bed to gather us this morning. And God called each of us by name. We greet our God in confession just as we are, disheveled and unsure, broken and beautiful. Let us pray. We thank you, God, that you know what it is to be human, fragile and vulnerable searching for ways to live in dangerous and complicated times. We thank you that you know the struggles and temptations of living in times of chaos and uncertainty. We thank you that you bring light to the world so that we see more clearly. We confess that sometimes it's easier to stay hidden where people can't see our weaknesses and our flaws. Forgive us. We confess that we do not heed the words of peace and justice that rang out from the heart and soul of our modern-day prophet, Martin Luther King, Jr. We confess that instead we have at times brought our anger, our selfishness, and our violence upon one another with our words and with our bodies. Forgive us. Cast your light, exposing our violent ways. Shine the warmth of your spirit into our brokenness. And with the power of your mercy and grace, heal within us each fissure. In silence, God, we bring the confessions of our hearts and minds into the light of your love.
We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Brothers and sisters in faith, our God knows you by name. And through, God, and through God's grace, you are forgiven and renewed. In your name, God's words are revealed again to us. This good news is full of joy and offers us deep peace. From my heart to yours, I extend to you the peace that is Christ Jesus. The peace of Christ be with you. Good morning to you and welcome to this second Sunday after Epiphany. <clears throat> Our reading this morning comes from 1 Samuel chapter 3, verses 1 through 20. Samuel is serving under Eli in the temple when he hears a voice. Samuel eventually comes to recognize this as the voice of God calling him into prophetic service. The story of Samuel's calling is far more subdued than most. There are no chariots with wheels made out of eyes, no burning bush, no force meeting of scrolls. There is just God's voice. Hear now these words of Scripture. Now the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord under Eli. The word of the Lord was rare in those days. Visions were not widespread. 
At that time, Eli, whose eyesight had begun to grow dim so that he could not see, was lying down in his room. The Lamb of God had not yet gone out. And Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called Samuel, Samuel, and he said, Here I am, and ran to Eli, and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call, lie down again. So he went and lay down. The Lord called again, Samuel. Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call you, my son, lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, and the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. The Lord called Samuel again a third time, and he got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord was calling the boy. Therefore Eli said to Samuel, Go, lie down, and if he calls you, you shall say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. Now the Lord came and stood there, calling as before, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, Speak, for your servant is listening. Then the Lord said to Samuel, See, I am about to do something in Israel that will make both ears of anyone who hears of it tingle. On that day, I will fulfill against Eli all that I have spoken concerning this, his house from beginning to end. For I have told him that I am about to punish his house forever for the iniquity that he knew because his sons were blaspheming God, and he did not restrain them. Therefore, I swear to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be expiated by sacrifice or offering forever. Samuel lay there until morning, then he opened the doors of the house of the Lord. Samuel was afraid to tell the vision to Eli, but Eli called Samuel and said, Samuel, my son. He said, Here I am. Eli said, What was it that he told you? Do not hide it from me. May God do so to you, and more also if you hide anything from me of all that he told you. So... Samuel told him everything and hid nothing from him. Then he said, It is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. As Samuel grew up, the Lord was with him and let none of his words fall to the ground. And all Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, knew that Samuel was a trustworthy prophet of the Lord. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Would you be with me in prayer? Holy One, Spirit of the living God, fall afresh upon these places we gather this morning. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts and the words of all our mouths be acceptable to you, O Lord, our Rock and our Redeemer. Amen. You know, I have to confess that Samuel is likely one of the biblical books with which I am least familiar. Some of the stories I know. Obviously, I am familiar with the many tales of Kings Saul and David, and of David's troubling children. But the truth is, this section of the Bible tends to slip under my radar. Of course, in that way that Scripture has, the more I continue to look at these texts and engage with them, the richer and more powerful they become. The more I try to pin them down and extract one simple, easy moral from the story, the more I look for a singular voice, the more these texts wriggle free and shift into more and more meanings. The story of the monarchy of Israel is one filled with larger-than-life characters, complicated characters that are both heroes and villains. Here we are introduced to Samuel. Samuel will prove to be imperfect, but he is by and large 
a wise and just prophet. Samuel was dedicated to God's service even before his conception. Hannah, Samuel's mother, asks God to provide her with a child, promising that what God gives to her, she will give back to God. And while some of us might not have paid as close attention to Samuel as we should have, his birth and his role in Israel's history is hard to overstate. He is truly a momentous figure. During Advent, we heard Mary's song of thanksgiving when she learned of her son Jesus, the Magnificat. This song is drawn from Hannah's song of thanksgiving for Samuel, an interesting connection between these two prophets and leaders. Samuel, who would establish the Israelite monarchy and eventually anoint King David, connected with Jesus who many would come to recognize as the heir of the reestablishment of the Davidic throne. Now, as I speak of rulers and succession, it is not lost on me that we are in a time of transition. I am preaching on the final Sunday of what has been the most divisive, toxic four years in the recent memory of our political life. And given that I am preaching on the Sunday before Martin Luther King Jr. Day, I feel particularly compelled to speak articulately and in no uncertain terms. What we have watched over the last four years has been a disgrace. Last week's violent insurrection at the United States Capitol could not have happened without a president who was willing to fan whatever flames necessary and risk even the collapse of American democracy into chaos. His constant string of lies and conspiracy theories, his open embrace of white supremacy and fascism, and his total self-absorption made this happen now. But I also want to be clear about something else. These problems are not over when he leaves office. However that winds up happening, they aren't over because they didn't start with him. They are exacerbated and mobilized openly in ways that we've not seen before in this country, but these elements of American society have been simmering for a long time. The racist narratives that undergird these stories of taking back this country have been present since our founding, since the first Europeans landed on these shores and declared all-out war on the indigenous and people of this continent, some since the first shipment of enslaved Africans arrived on our shores. And so as we enter into this week that will, by the grace of God, I pray, see a peaceful transition of power, we do well to remember that while we may breathe a sigh of relief knowing that the madman is no longer at the helm, we have still got an immense task ahead of us. And it is here, at this moment of national crisis, that I have come again to Samuel, whose importance was perhaps lost on me until now. Samuel was a prophet and a judge of Israel. He was recognized as a man of integrity, trusted with making judgments about what was right and wrong. At this moment in Israel's history, the nation is ruled by these wise judges to whom God speaks. Samuel is, as we later learn, the last of the judges. When we look at this section of the Bible, the former prophets which is encapsulated by Joshua, Judges, Samuel, and Kings, we see the nation transition from a group of people making a conquest into a new land, then raising up wise elders to rule once they had established themselves, and eventually we see a nation fractured into northern and southern domains. The echoes are a bit haunting. Samuel represents this transitional time. In our passage this morning, we see the moment when God first speaks to Samuel. It's, it's a bit common. God calls him, and he goes running to Eli. 
Finally, after three times, Eli explains what is happening and tells Samuel to wait. And the next time he hears that voice call his name, to invite God to speak. And the message that God gives Samuel, we find out, is not great news for Eli. Samuel is told that Eli's household will not continue to judge. Rather, it is Samuel who is to succeed him. For someone invested in keeping power, this is not good news. Thankfully, Eli receives this message with abundant grace. This question of succession will continue throughout Israel's history. Samuel wishes to leave his sons in charge at the end of his service. And the people rebel, demanding that Samuel give them a king. And so Samuel, the wise, discerning servant of the people and the servant of God that he was, anoints King Saul, and Israel has its first honor. Years later, it is Samuel again who anoints the next king, and once again, it's not who we might expect. Rather than Saul's oldest son, Jonathan, it is David, the shepherd, Saul's son-in-law, the youngest son of Jesse, who is anointed. Samuel was a kingmaker. He was one who felt bound by duty. To do right by the people that he served, even when it at times went against his own self-interest. Samuel had a sense that being a nation of just rule was more important than blatant self-promotion. Now, I want to be clear, we can't draw a direct parallel to American democracy. Many have tried in recent years, arguing that God has always raised up imperfect leaders and that we must still follow them, no matter what. I think that such simple suggestions fail to do justice to the problem. They make it all too easy to explain away the indiscretions and accept the things that should be unacceptable. Yet I believe that there is much to be learned from Samuel and from this pivotal moment in Israel's history, lessons that find new resonance in these transitional times. You see, Samuel was a kingmaker. He had the authority and the power to anoint leaders, and he had the platform and the ability to speak truth to power and to be heard. We, American citizens, are not kingmakers per se. In fact, we've not taken kindly to kings in this country. But in this nation, we are the ones who hold the power to choose who will lead. The events of the past few months have borne that out time and time again. <clears throat> we have seen, to use the Oxford Dictionary's word of the year for 2020, an unprecedented effort to suppress votes. We know that black communities and communities of color are disproportionately targeted to be disenfranchised. When that failed, we saw a sitting president refuse to accept the succession of power and even incite an angry mob to storm the United States Capitol. We are still reeling from what happened, and we are still learning more and more chilling details of just how violent and hate-filled that riot was. And yet, here we are, ready to carry on, not as normal, because the past four years and the horror of this pandemic have made it clear that there is no normal we ever want to go back to. Not back to normalcy, but hopefully into something new, something more just and equitable, hopefully into something more abundant, something that gives more people a chance to flourish, a chance to be heard, a chance to survive. And so as we stand in this liminal space, this transitional time, this in-between time, I want you to pause and ask what truth you will speak 
to power. We know that we live in a country that continues to deny black communities the opportunities afforded to white communities. We know that. We know that we live in a country that has treated and continues to treat indigenous peoples as a problem to be solved rather than sovereign peoples to be respected. We know that. We know that we live in a country where billionaires and millionaires grow richer every day and there are 14 million kids who are hungry. We know that. So what will we do? We have raised our voices as individuals and as a nation. We've elected a new leader. That simply isn't enough. I hope that we are all able to breathe a little easier, knowing that our nation's capital might once again be held to some standard of decorum and decency. But decorum and decency are not enough. We have a responsibility. It is a civic responsibility, but it is also a moral responsibility to continually demand that our leaders seek justice and to keep on lifting our voices. And more importantly, more importantly, we have a responsibility to keep lifting the voices of others who are not being as we saw in our reading from Samuel this morning, God's voice isn't always the loudest in the room. Sometimes it may seem to speak to us clearly, but more often it weaves in and out of other voices, told in part and only being heard in its fullness when like a jazz song, all of the sounds come together to create something more beautiful than the sum of their parts. And so in the days and weeks and years to come, I charge you to listen and to pray. As you listen, may you hear stories that challenge you to rethink and reimagine who you are who your neighbors are, who we might become. I charge you to listen to the voices that are drowned out in the noise. I charge you to listen to the ones that sound different, the ones that irritate you, the ones that you don't understand. And I charge you to pray. Pray that God will give all of us the wisdom and the courage and the compassion to listen intently and to speak truth to power, to place justice, mercy, and peace above prosperity and individual ambition, no matter who's in charge. You cannot set it and forget it when it comes to governing. That was true in Israel, it's true now. We must continue to hold our leaders accountable. Martin Luther King Jr. assured us that the moral arc of the universe bends towards justice, but I believe that the Reverend Doctor would agree that it only bends when we lean on it. So catch your breath, shake out a little bit, and set your feet, and lean. Lean like our lives depend on it, because they do. Amen.
Hi, friends. Please join me in a spirit of prayerfulness. The psalmist writes, O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from far away. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, O Lord, you know it completely. You hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is so high that I cannot attain it. Holy One, God of the heavens and the earth, God of the stars and of the sea, God who created every living thing, God who has spoken through prophets, and God incarnate, born into flesh, God with us, God who calls each of us by name. We come before you in awe of your incredible creation that surrounds us, knowing that we are just one part of the complex ecosystem of life you design. Each day we wake up, we breathe in and out, and experience the gift of life you offer us. And we give you thanks. Thank you, God, for the universe that inspires our wonder, the stars that allude to galaxies far away, the moon that keeps our planet company even when we cannot see it, and for the sun, which gives us light and energy and warmth, faithfully sustaining all precious and fragile life on earth. Even as you are majestic and transcendent God of all creation, so too are you a deeply intimate God. You search us and know us. You discern our thoughts with us. You search out our paths and are acquainted with all our ways. Even before we speak, you know what we will say, and you hem us in behind and before and lay your hands on us in blessing. O oh God, this knowledge can be too much for us to take in, too incredible for us to comprehend, and we give you thanks. Thank you, God, for creating each of us uniquely, for caring for us, for loving us, and for abiding with us, and for always being with us. Thank you for the miracle and mystery of your incarnate love, born in Israel, and yet extended and available to all people in every nation and all of creation. We come before you in great gratitude for who you are and for who you call us to be, stewards of your creation, proclaimers of your justice and compassion, bearers of your love. We pray, O God, for our beloved earth and for all the creatures that call it home, creatures that walk and crawl and fly and swim. We pray that the human family will humble itself, and find its place in the great tapestry of life on earth, and that we will change our ways to truly care for your creation. We pray for our nation in this tumultuous time as folks are deeply divided, as truth is under assault, and as mistrust is rampant. We pray for wisdom and understanding, for compassion and patience, even as we demand justice for the vulnerable and accountability for those whose actions lead to oppression and disenfranchisement. 
May new leadership be a step in the right direction, a step closer to a society built on dignity and respect for all people, particularly those who have been left on the margins. We pray, O oh God, for our local communities, our cities and our towns and neighborhoods, and for our family of faith at Village Church. May we continue to find ways to stay connected with one another during the cold of winter, to care for one another, and to continue reimagining being church in the times we've been given. We pray for all of this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us these words. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, can you see the light streaming into this beautiful sanctuary? Our common life is so full of that light, and we are called to shine that light as the body of Christ into the world. I love this season of Epiphany, in which we together make our promises and pledges for the year to come. I'm grateful for the Stewardship Committee and their leadership, and I encourage you to watch the mail this week for your invitation and pledge to make your promise to support the work, the mission, the ministry of this great congregation, and most of all, our calling to shine God's light into God's beautiful and broken world. Our common life is rich and full in these weeks. On January the 31st, we will celebrate our long-held tradition of joint worship with our beloved sister congregation, the Charles Street AME Congregation. We look forward to worshiping together with them remotely, of course, this year on a new date, but with the same deep commitment. And we're planning to journey together through Lent this year. On February the 7th, we will dedicate all of our pledges and gifts for the coming year. And on February 14th, we will have our annual meeting as a congregation in which we accept the budget and when we elect new leaders. Today, following worship, 
During the Zoom coffee hour, we will have a budget hearing so you can preview that which is planned for the coming year and give your best consideration to how you will support it with your gifts. Let us pray. God, we dedicate our common life to you. We ask that all that we do and all that we say together would be to your glory. Most of all, that you would fill us with your light, that we could faithfully be your instruments shining that light into the world. Make of us evermore a beloved community together with our partner churches. Make more of us together than any of us can be apart. We give ourselves to you praying that your will will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. Beloved, go forth from this place, listening for God's voice in the oh-so-many places that it speaks to us. Listening for the many languages, for the many voices that lift it up, that come together to more fully reveal God's truth to us right now. And as you go to be about the work of seeking justice and loving mercy, take with you these gifts the love and the power of god our creator and our sustainer the grace and peace of jesus christ who walks beside us and the joy of the holy spirit who binds us together with all those who seek god's truth and love in all times and all places now and forever <laughs>